On tonight's show, I have Carlos Tabernaberry joining me. He's going to be sharing his formula for earning trust, obedience and respect from your horses. He's going to talk to us about how horses learn and a really interesting conversation about the history of the bit. Right after that, we're going to have Winnie and Kyoko in the chat box. They're a little bit snippety that Dad's been away for a couple of weeks, so let's see what they've got to say about that. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Welcome to the Animals Television Show everyone. I'm your show host Romy Bueller and I'm so excited that this show has finally made its appearance. This is the first episode of hopefully many shows to come. Now as you would know, animals are really struggling across the planet at the moment. They're unwell, they're not getting what they need from us, they're going into extinction and mostly because of us. So every week I want to bring someone in to share their skills, to share their expertise and their knowledge so we can look after our animals in a way that they need. The show is going to be broadcast every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, and you'll find it on YouTube, Facebook, and the website. I'd love it if you could share it with all your animal-loving friends and family so we can create this movement of better animal care and welfare. Right now, we have Carlos waiting for us. Now, he might describe himself as the accidental horseman, Others describe him as the world's most gentle horseman, and I can see why. Let's go chat to Carlos and see what he's got to share with us today. Thank you, Carlos, for joining me in the Animals Television Show. Welcome. Can you share with us a little about your background with horses and your passion for horses and, and how you got into the training side? Uh, thanks, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Ron. It's, sort of, it's a pleasure to be on your show. And um, I grew up in Argentina, which is very uh, traditions. Uh, run deep with horses and so I'm a fourth generation horseman uh, in a nutshell I grew up with lots of traditions or traditions that get passed down and I made a promise to the horse when I was young that if I ever touched the horse I wasn't going to do what I've seen like so even I would say to people traditions don't make things right so there's a yes. lot of traditions that are a bit outdated and traditions are, are made by men, not by the horses anyway. So even though I had a rich sort of um, horse culture around me, I, I, to be honest, I was, I call myself, it was like the accidental horseman because uh, trainer, <laughs> trainer is a bad, trainer is a bad word anyway. We don't train horses to do anything. Um, I said, I just make sure I understand them and don't get on in the way of horses. But so I grew up seeing, we can say, you know, it still happens to this day all around the world um, where horses are literally broken. You know, there's, yeah. you know, whether whether it's the, our, car, our domestic horses or you know horses that run wild in Argentina as well, all around the world is the same thing, and they literally the term broken in is you know you break the spirit. And I I used to to be a pole as a kid and took, I, I rode horses as a kid and everything. But if someone would have said to me, "Do you want to train horses?" I would have gone, "No, 
because I can't do that. I, 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 there's no way I'm going to do what I see. So, I, so I follow the obvious. I was fortunate enough to be able to have a, a place with 600 horses, and whatever men said didn't apply to horses. So I, I, I think I became like I wouldn't say self-taught, but definitely horse-taught. So I was 100% horse-taught. You know, so I could hear people say one thing, and then I saw how the horses interacted with each other, and I thought, well, that's totally different. So I, I think it was the power of observation for me, and then. When I started handling horses, when someone would say, oh, I've got the horse that won't do this, won't do that, is bad, you know. And, and I always say, there's no such thing as a bad horse, you know. Um, I used to kind of volunteer and I had no idea what I was doing, but the horses were telling me real quick what I had to do. And and, and sort of applying that gentle. So I, I did the opposite. And, you know, I, and one thing that I'm proud of, you know, that I, I've been termed as the world's most gentle horseman. So I, it's not about the riches or the fastest, I always said, it's just, but it is that softness and applying the horse behavior so to benefit the horse and not the human ego yeah well i think that goes with all animals doesn't it you know you don't what do you get out of an animal when you're yelling and aggressive towards mm -hmm. them they're just they're just going to run away um from you uh so you're probably very intuitive then as well carlos you know do do you feel like you work intuitively you just kind of know how to although you've been doing this for a long time now, but to start yeah. with, was it purely just observation and being self-taught or do you think you just had this inner knowing of what the best way to work with a horse was? Yeah, I, I think it's 100%. Just it, was, it was like, I guess because I had, you know, you go with an empty cup to the horse, you know. I, I can only talk about horses. I mean, my, I don't have a lot of experience. I mean, dogs jump all over me and, you know, I love all the animals, but um, horses, I guess, is what, what, you know, my passion was. Yeah. And, so it definitely, I think it's just going to the horse with an empty cup and then just, like I said, more power of observation and seeing how they how they respond and just um, learn to read the horse, the signs that the horses were giving. And that came from the herd, but also when I was working with the horse, whether you advance it too quick to the horse or not quick enough. And, and, and so I call them my master teachers, you know, I mean, the horses definitely have been, it's not a romantic thing, but it's just, it's just, I credit everything that I do to, to the horses. They were my the, the masters, you know, so I was the student, you know, and now I'm in a position after so many years with the horses that we kind of swap roles. So you, you become teacher and student of the horse at the same time, you know, so. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it was definitely, I still do it to this day and I still, um, you know, I, st I, I still love it. You know, their passion hasn't gone away. And, and just to know, you know, you, you sort of start to know, and especially at clinics, I had a clinic on the weekend and I said to people, the horse would do A, B, C, now next, you know, without me asking him to do anything, or the horse would just think about that and sort of soak it in and chew on it and the horse does it, you know. So you, you, you have that that sort of report with the horse that I think is, uh, um, which, which I love and it's hard to explain to people, you know. It's not just about the exercise and you get the horse to do A, B, C, it's just about getting the horse to understand what you want. and ask the right questions you get the right answers from the horse you know so. yeah are there some common issues that you see with the owners or riders in their understanding or lack of um and working with horses are there some things that you see all of the time um yeah and i'm going to say this in the nicest way you know and and i never met a horse that didn't didn't wasn't prepared to change how's that yeah nice but, but I mean, <laughs> But, but I met a lot of people that they can see, you know, you can see sort of miracles in front of their eyes, you know, where you can turn a horse around and they're still, they're not prepared to change. So I, I think it's always, it's always us. It's never, it's never the horse, you know, where, yeah. and I think even though, yes, you can say I'm training a horse, you know, like I said, I would say more schooling a horse would be a better word, but yes, um, I'm definitely training people, you know, so it's, and, and, and I'm fortunate that people, like I'm not a big, I don't advertise, you know, sort of I'm talking to you because somehow, you know, you, you sort of came and, and we connected, you know, but um, that was never my intention to be say, oh, I want to be the world's most famous horseman. I just want to be the best horseman that I can be for the horse, you know, so um, people, horses, horses, I was fine, you know, never met a horse that was born bad, you know, and and I guess it's not bad people, the circumstance and what happens, but um, horses are prepared, they're so willing and noble you know sort of to to want to change you know that for the better i mean they, they yeah. do want to, they seek that safety and the comfort comfort and the born pleases you know and 
I guess they don't have that inner noise in their head, you know, that us as humans do have, you know, sort of with because of the past or, or something that hasn't happened. Um, horses are very present, as we know, and I think us as humans that we know, and then that's that's a sort of gap that I try to bridge between horse and people to say, empty your cup, leave the world behind, and just get into horse world right now because that's that's what the horse needs in order for you to understand him, you know. How do horses learn? And what is the best way for humans or riders to communicate with them? Well, this is what I ask every person that I work with. I said, again, in the clinic on the weekend, I had from Grand Prix riders, eventers to radio people, you know, so pleasure riders. And that's the beauty. I am very versatile, so I can work from, i got some classical background through French roots on my part and the working horse with a lab. So I combine the two. And I was asked that question, you say, how do horses learn? And everyone goes... Uh, repetition that's the first thing that comes up and I, yeah. it's actually four areas that horses learn and this is what i teach people and i say just think about this because as people have been running for such a long time and i find that they still don't understand how horses learn so and I, so i explain to them it's like four areas of learning you know we've got the pecking order which we're all familiar and that's one that most people be sort of relate to say oh the pecking order you got the alpha horse and the the, the lower you know they're on the bottom and I said, that's one area. So you got picking order. We've got when the horses are pressure release. The horses and brumbies are a good example. I got brumbies. I love wild horses, uh, and I call them wild, not feral. So they they learn to push a fence, for example. So they, they they kind of approach a fence, and once they get comfortable, I've seen that in the outback many times, and they they kind of push a fence as just that pressure release, and then they know that if it gives. The pre- it gives to pressure they continue doing it and it's the same with say a horse that pushes people on the ground or a horse that a little bit more dominant and has learned to kind of manipulate the person a bit and they would use that pressure release in the same way so if the person gives they keep on pushing and then you know so there's the pecking order pressure and release uh, advance and retreat so like an example would be a horse scared of a say a plastic bag in the paddock mm-hmm. he goes to it runs away and he's, he might be on the herd runs with him and then the braver horse will just go back again and might get within 50 meters and runs away until makes that approach that event until realizes they can sniff that plastic bag and that he's not going to kill him so <laughs> you know and to me one of the most important areas and i think is is uh, visual learning you know where i am um, a good example i just give you examples of people who say maybe your viewers can also relate to it yes it's where, where you got a bunch of horses in uh in a, in the inside in pasture in the paddock and uh one horse lays down one horse starts to lay down and you see the other ones kind of oh yeah I lay down too so a monkey see monkey do kind of thing yeah. you know or in the arena i said i don't let him lay down in the arena because it's like the classroom but if someone allows a horse to say uh lay, let the horse sort of roll in the arena you find that any horse that is around they might say oh that's pretty good i'm just gonna do the same so there's those four areas visual learning like i said it's a picking order which is the one that most people are familiar this pressure and release advance and retreat and the visual learning and i think a lot of people like um really don't or hasn't they haven't been taught or they haven't seen that there's four areas of learning not just the one or the two if they if you're familiar with those four areas you've got a better understanding how to train that horse if it makes sense yes yeah because you can use the picking order will be i don't let the horse push me around sort of i move the horse uh, you know two types of horses in the herd the the ones i get push and the ones that are pushing so when I say I'm pushing, there's no hitting, there's no pulling, there's no yanking on the horse, uh, none of that. So it's just creating that your bubble has to be bigger than the horse, you know, and you achieve that through consistency and, you know, you're building the trust with the horse. So, um, But the visual learning is important too because you see people just running around and screaming all day long and then by the, the time they go, to the, they go to the horse paddy, the horse runs away and they say, oh, that's a city horse, I don't want to be caught today. And, and it's just... They they watch they watch you like constantly watch you. I mean that's the mind of a prey animal, you know. Like survival um, yes. depends on that instinct of watching, smelling, seeing, feeling. So that's the areas that you bring to the horse when I train. I bring that feel. You bring you know you bring that we can call it energy or I said you know empty your cup. You know like you know whether you people call it energy or uh, but you have to have that empty cup when you approach a horse or might as well don't do it for nervous riders you know there's a lot of people that i talk to that especially older older people not so much the kids because kids seem to be until something happens they're very courageous 
But as they get older and they've had a couple of falls or, you know, the their horse starts shying or bolting or, or whatever it is, they start to get really nervous and anxious leading up to even getting on. Um, do you have any suggestions for the older riders out there? Yes, for sure. I mean, I work with so many people and, and I think you have to have, you have to seek the help of a, a coach or an instructor that is not that is not going to push you. They, they should be able. So you have to have the ability to read the horse. Obviously, that goes without saying. Because I've seen and I I get a lot of people that come from being going to other people, and when they tell me the story, it's kind of like they got being pushed too far too soon. As a coach, I would say I have to be able to the people that I work with. I have to give them the why, not the how. The how is not good enough. So. A lot of people say, well, I'm nervous. Um, well, you just get on that horse and they go, why? Because this is how you supposed to do it. So yeah. you have to be able to give the person the why, the reasons why, and what happens in between, you know, sort of, uh, uh, I would say between the reaction and the and what's going to happen, there's a gap in between, and you have to work with people in that gap and say, all right, I know you're scared, I know your word, we're going to help you. And then tailor that training for that person it's pretty much hard to display um, explain on a video but um it's getting that person just at their own level and just gently bringing them up yeah to meet the the horse you know kind of thing and if the horse is the other way around or the boss nervous then my job is actually to work with with both and, and do a kind of a bit of that you know so until they yeah they match you know so yeah. and i've got a little formula that i use you know and i say we all want it's in my book you know and it says I said, we all want trust, obedience, and respect. Obedience is not, you t I tell them what to do. Obedience is when the horse is willing to give. But in order to have trust, obedience, and respect, you have to have confidence, consistency, and kind leadership. Mm, so, I love it. Yeah. So uh, it's a little formula in my book, and I call it, you know, CCKL equals TRR. So confidence, consistency, and kind leadership equals trust, obedience, and respect. So mm. we're not going to have, so a lot of horses are very obedient. They have no trust. They have no respect. So at the end of that formula, you're just gonna get the oh, there's you know, the obedience. That's everybody. Yeah. It's like, I was like, it's like pointing a gun to someone and say, yeah. "You will do, you will do this for me." And the person go, "Yeah," because I'm not silly, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. But so it's a bit like that. So, but I said in order to get that. So I take the people. So the, that's a, what we want: the horse, the trust, the obedience, and the respect. And I say, "Well, are, are we confident?" No, I'm not. But I'm very kind. And I go, okay, so you're kind and that's great, but we still have to establish that confidence in your part and that consistency because when you're not confident, you're not going to be consistent anyway. You're going to be nervous, some days more nervous than other days. So yeah, my job is yeah. to take that person to that first C. So I go, okay, let's work on your confidence. Let's work on your consistency. I'm, I'm really happy that you're like very kind so we can work on that kind leadership. Now we're going to get the horse then to trust you to be obedient and to have lots of respect for you. Yeah, I like that. And that actually gives people something to work with as well because if they're not having much success with whatever they're trying to do, if you've got something that you can go, okay, oh, okay, I really need to work on the confidence or the consistency, whichever yeah. part of it that is, that's breaking down there. Yeah. Um, this is just a little bit off tangent, but... Again, it's it's one of those things that um, I've seen with people that are quite apprehensive. They want to, and you may be able to share a bit of the history of when when and what the bit is for in a horse, but people that I've spoken to want to ride with a bitless bridle, yeah. and but they're too apprehensive to do that. How much time do we got? <laughs> <That's a laughs> yeah. I can give you the whole history of it. So... I've, I'm, I'm known for my sayings many ways, you know, and I say, if you want to try beardless, you know, I said, the only beard a horse needs is a bit of understanding. He doesn't need a beard, number one. Yeah. So I, I grew up where traditions, a horse goes, um, you, you start a horse on the saddle, they break him, I start him, right? So it's two, two different things. So that horse will go, my family, it's a tradition, so the horse will be beardless for two years. So the horse gets to, there's a lot of changes in the horse's jaw as well, so you have to allow for that. So the horse learns to stop, turn, um, back up, turn around and so on, just by using more the weight aids of the rider, the horse's, the horse's seat, the, the rider's seat and to influence that horse. Then after two years, you introduce the snuffle. That snuffle big goes for, say, another another 
two years they ride with the snaffle and then the horse will introduce later on to a uh, to a curb and so on so I, it never made sense to me and i go if i if i'm working a horse for two years you know without a bride and i get him to use to my see what would i introduce once i get that's tradition what people don't understand the beats were like I, I remember when when i started training people got to know me a little bit more they said oh that's a beatless guy and it was almost <laughs> like a, a tag that i said no I'm, I'm a horse guy so i'm doing it for the horse i'm not doing it because i'm training or because i I want to ride unicorns or anything like that. It wasn't nothing <laughs> to do with that, you know. So, um, but beats were introduced. I mean, we've been domesticating horses for say six thousand years, and the, the beat was not introduced for about uh, about fifteen hundred years later, right? You know, to two thousand years. So, so out of the first, I mean, uh, my great grandmother's Cherokee Indians. So I got that. I've been, you know, and I've been fortunate to work with the Apaches, Lakotas, and the Cherokees in America. And I'm taking them back to what they used to do. So I'm teaching American Indians how to ride beatless and how to get on a horse bareback again if they want to, you know. So it's kind of strange that they, so they they gone with the modern world and then they went backwards, you know. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, so for one and a half, people said, "Oh, is this a trendy fat thing?" And I said, "No." For one and a half thousand years, so I know my horse history, and people don't, you know, for one and a half thousand years there was no beats, you know, to two thousand. So then i know what happened someone couldn't stop a horse because they didn't have enough foundation there was no trust there was no respect the horse would have been scared and someone said i can't pull this horse up and some bright spark would have gone hmm, okay they got no teeth in there let's put <laughs> let's put thorns so they used to put thorns on the oh. on, on the bars and then that turned into bone so then the first bits were made out of bone and then the iron age came and we never looked back and now 2021 we're still in the dark ages when it comes to the poor horses you know that's how i feel yeah. you know yeah. and i know that i copped a fair bit of uh, criticism for defending the horse but that's my job someone called me the horse lawyer <laughs> and, I, and i said and i said i'm not the horse lawyer i'm like more like a qc you know, like a barrister you know and i'm like, well. <laughs> so, I, yeah. i'm definitely going to defend the horse when he needs to be defending so that's it kind of briefly that's a history yeah. inside beats and why um i had a lady yesterday she's a local and she she's had the third lesson with me and she said i want to learn to be gentle to my horse and you're the guy i know you're soft and kind you highly recommend it but i would never write bill list and i went that's okay i'm not going to force you um yesterday she actually had after the third lesson she was writing bill list. so but not because i forced that because i said see how the horse you know it's not responding to the bit properly it does cause pain in the mouth i'm not saying this because i want you to go be less blah 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 and then you're under supervision. I said, how much do you trust me? She said, 100%. I said, we're going to take the bit of your horse and I'm going to put one of my billless bridles on, which I did. And, and she was like, so, so happy. And the horse was so happy. It was almost like every time the horse came to pass, he was winking an eye and saying, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. You know, like, <laughs> so a person that said never, when I when I went through the how it affects the horse, the biomechanics, the bit can affect the biomechanics of the horse, the pain factor, even when people said I ride with soft hands and so it's still it's a foreign object the horse's mouth should be tight i mean when i'm saying tight it should be sealed uh and relaxed and when you got a bit the horse is always opening the mouth which it causes a chill reflex is your horse is salivating and trying literally to speed the bit out or opening the mouth um there's a lot of photos online people i'm sure they've seen my horses are stopping with the opening the mouth because that's just avoiding pain that the mouth is like wide open you know and then it's okay because you get so many tools you go to the local horse shop and they say my horse opens the mouth so they give you a drop nose band and say you just tie it really tight and the horse can open the mouth or it becomes bondage you know for the poor horse you know so yeah it's always there's always tools and gimmicks and i said i don't use them I, I don't use spurs i don't use beats i don't use any of these i use you know i do in-hand word work and i might use the bamboo just to teach him to stand square or do a, a spanish walk or something like that because can't reach with my finger but it shouldn't be all these tools i mean that my horse doesn't stop get a bigger bit my horse raised up get the anterior bit my horse that's xyz there's always a tool for everything but there's no understanding so i'm not bringing the tools to people if anything i take tools away and bring understanding and they actually get surprised how much better the horse goes when you strip away all the tools and you implement more knowing horse knowing yeah well, I mean, there's okay. a double bonus there because it's cheaper, isn't it? They don't have to buy, they don't have to buy these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
I'm not saying that the local horse shops um, here, they would not stock my book or <laughs> anything. No, they, they kind of, they love what I do, but they told me, uh, the boss said I put him out of business because I, <laughs> so, but yeah. it's not that I'm trying to put him out of business. If he was like, oh, I need to buy a bigger beer. Go, no, you just got bigger bit of understanding. So my horse doesn't, I get bigger spurs and I go, no, a horse has to be schooled on the leg. He doesn't know what a leg means. So, and then they surprise how they, they, need, they can throw away all this gear so they can have the idea kind of thing, if it makes sense. And I feel if I control, you know, if I have to control a horse through through metal in his mouth, you know, it's like, well, I don't really, I can't claim then that I have, that I've got trust. I might have opinions. Yeah. Yes. I don't have I don't have respect, even though the horse might do everything I say, the mm. respect is coming out of fear because it's coming out of pain. So yes. I don't have yeah. that. So my, my girl didn't I just retired. I did it uh, I did some shows and I I, I wrote in brotherless and bareback and someone say, Why do you write brotherless? And I say, Because I can, because my relationship with that horse is that great that I mean it took steps to get to that, but it goes to show that even say cantering or galloping a bit uh, a brotherless horse. That he still is going to stop. I'm not saying go home and try it tomorrow, but mm. it's something you, you can build to. So it's and it's just to prove a point. So that once again, it's almost like the story of my horse career has always been. We don't need all this gear. We don't need all these tools. We don't need. We just need that understanding. We need to know get to know our horses. You know, there's a lot of uh, equestrians, and I said to people, I want you to be the best horsewoman that you can be. I want to be the best horseman that I can be. Every day is an opportunity. To be a better horsewoman, a better horseman, anyone can be an equestrian. And by that I mean, you just buy a horse, you buy all the gear. When things don't work out, you buy more tools. You get the horse to do what you want. When that doesn't work, you just buy another one, because that's what happens. And that horse gets mm -hmm. passed down, where yeah. ends up maybe at the knackeries, you know, and there's yeah. over a hundred thousand horses get killed every year, which is in this mm. country. Huh? Um, yes. Yeah, and that's just Australia. I mean, that's a, a global problem, isn't it? And do you have any um, any hot tips or suggestions for the young riders of, um, you know, perhaps the sport horses, uh, the young kids that are setting out or just starting out and um, trying to be the best that they can? Yeah, just I mean, have fun whether you're young or old. I said this is what that's what I what I bring to my clinics and lessons. I mean, that's me. So it tends to be half horse cleaning, half stand up comedy by the sounds of it. But <laughs> everyone, everyone everyone has a great time and everyone learns in a, in in a comfortable environment. So it just have fun. I mean, the the fun's been taken out of um, horsemanship, you know. And I think yeah. that's once again to have that equestrian influence and not and forget the horsemanship side of things. So just have fun and question yeah. things just because you're young doesn't mean you can't question if you're working yes. with a horse you're intelligent enough by now to and understand that some things don't sound right they're not right and that you can question and once again young or old if you can someone can give you the why then you look for somebody else that can because that's what i do i make sure that if i can't give someone a why they shouldn't be coming to me I, it's not good enough to mm. say, well, this is how we do things. This is how tradition tells us to do it. Yeah, it's yeah. How it's done, you go and do it. No, yeah. you got to give the person the why. So ask for the why, have fun, and question, question things. Yeah, great tips. And I think, you know, especially for the for the younger ones, because we are, um, or back when back when we were you know you're very guided by your trainers or the older people of influence or parents or whoever it is so you kind of take them at their word and, and it's depending on how you've been brought up questioning is not really a part of your upbringing but it's a it's a really great point because that intuition comes back in and it's like it doesn't feel right it just doesn't sound right i don't and uh, no. and then there's a problem right there you're doing yeah, something that goes against the grain a little bit. And I was told that because I come from, like I said, you know, this is two, three hundred years of tra horse traditions, you know. And they, if, if I question something and they said, you know, well, you know, who do you think you are? And I go, I'm, not, I'm nobody. I'm just a kid. You know, I'm just asking a question. You know that. So I'm, I've always been pretty strong that way. It's like a horse that it was hard to catch, not because he was scared, but because he was defined to be caught, you know, until someone asked you the, the question or gave you the right answer. So. Either nothing. So I 
and I thought that was a disadvantage for me, even when I came to Australia at age 15, where I thought, uh, gee, I never went to Pony Club, I never went, you know, and, and I think it was a blessing in disguise because I was, you want to ride a horse, they put, they saddle the horse, they put you on it, and they give a horse a tap on the bottom, and they said the horse took off, and they said, you work it out and let me know how you went. So that's how I learned. So yeah. I developed a, a huge amount of feel for that horse. And, and, and now I think I'm blessed that I didn't have a human telling me how to ride a horse, that I didn't have um, someone say, you must do this. They, they passed down traditional, the classical stuff and a lot of beautiful stuff, but it was never showing, you know? So they just said, well, you go and work it out. That's how you do it. And I did. And I think that's how I became the uh, accidental horse trainer in many ways, you know? So uh, someone saw me working with a, a, a rescue horse that I had bought at the time. It was a guy with a race horse and he said, yeah. I want you to train my race horse. He's getting scratched and throwing jockeys. And I said, I'm not a horse trainer. And he said, I've been watching you for three months from the hill with binoculars. So I thought that was pretty scary. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty scary. I've been mean, stalking you. <laughs> I was stalking you. So I trained his horse and I just kind of word got around. And then I had people say, can you teach me to ride? I said, I'm not a riding coach. And they said, yes, you are. Because I've seen you, you go and bear back on your horse up the hills. And I want to learn to ride and, and have a good seat. And then I go. So it all started like that and it just grew to to what it is today, I suppose, you know. Yeah. I imagine, um, you know, having all of these, you know, the trust and, and the kindness and all, all of that sort of thing, that the injuries would be less as well. Is, would that be true or is that 100%. just? 100%. I, I just, you know, and I, I would share this, you know, openly, like we all get, you know, horses stepping on your toes here and there and stuff. I'm, I'm knock on wood, I'm being fortunate that because I work the way I work, that after so, so many years, the only break that I ever had a horse, I broke my fibula, you know, going back maybe 15 years ago plus, only because the horse, I was retraining a poor horse that had been abused, a racehorse, and I was yeah. running, and, and he actually slipped on the ground. Right. And, and he fell on top of me and broke my fibula. And I remember being on the ground and hearing the crack on my bone, and I went, I thought it was a horse, and I went, oh, no, the horse just broke his leg. And I'm, I'm just almost crying because the horse broke his leg. And the horse gets up, and does a little trot around, comes and sniffs me, and then I got up, and I thought, oh, it was me. It wasn't the horse. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but but that, was, that was a freakish thing. And, yeah. And, 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 and knock on wood from that, I have it. And, the, and, I, and exactly what you said, I share that with a lot of people because I say, well, you've worked with so many horses. You've been around wild horses, Mustangs, Brumbies. Kanamo, uh, Kamana was in, in New Zealand, your name in Argentina. And I go, no, I haven't because that, I think that gentle approach and that understanding more than gentle, that understanding uh, actually has allowed me to be injury free for so long. Yeah. Uh, and, know, and that would go the same for the actual horse themselves outside of, you know, slipping and things like that. Would they, have you seen less injuries in the actual horses too? I have my horses, you know, they don't colic, they never have injuries, they, you know, they're calm. The horses are calm and they're relaxed. They don't need to go panic mode and be galloping around the paddocks, you know, like, because they're stressing out or someone is chasing them and yelling them and yelling at them. So I've, I've seen that in people that work with me, they don't, they're, they're, they're lucky, they don't have horse injuries or human injuries. All my injuries are I, sport related. I, I keep feet and then I do like CrossFit and all my injuries always come from doing sports. So, so if you want to yeah. start injury free, um, let's try to be less fit. That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Carlos, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you tonight. Likewise. I've really enjoyed it. Could talk to you for ages. I'm sure there's so much for people to learn. Can you let everyone know? Because not everyone lives around the corner from yeah. you. They might have their binoculars on you, but they don't yeah, they don't live right. nearby. Can people learn from you? And how do they yes. go about doing that? So, and this, this came as a result of people asking, the same as you're saying. So I've got, uh, started doing uh, from last year uh, online video. So they can go to whisperingacres.com and okay. they can sign up. It's a membership for the whole year. And there's about, I think it's already up to 65 videos. All the, all the videos that I put up every month, they, they actually current videos. So it's not videos from when I was like 15, you know, they're all current. <laughs> you see. You can see the gray hair and stuff and everything. So, but they <laughs> that's actually. What hats are for. <laughs> Sorry. That's what hats are for. <laughs> yeah, that's. Oh yeah, no, but that's wisdom hair. So anyway, so that's it. it happens. True. But <laughs> so they can go to whisperingacres.com. They can sign if you're far away. If you don't live in Victoria, 
um, keep an eye, or even if they want to organize a clinic. But if they sign up, sign up online, they got access to those training videos as well. And yeah. every right. single horse, I mean, there's dividing into sections from groundwork to in hand problem solving and under saddle. So you got people get a good and and liberty work. So they've got those areas to to look. And all the horses that are on the videos featured on the videos are horses that are currently in training. So they're not horses that well this horse couldn't do this now he does it so you actually see the the horse having the non-understanding what the the movement is or having a problem say with uh flying lead change or, or can't canter lead as an example and how i go about it to in that same session to fix it and right. how the horse makes and it is unedited in that way so you, you see the horse the raw footage where the horse is kind of it and i start talking through the horse I explain how that we, we do that. So it's quite informative and a great opportunity from people to, to, to sort of um, to see how we can work gentle with a horse and, and have success with them. So, yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, I hope everybody out there that is working with horses or owns horses uh, has them in their lives in some way watches this show, follows Carlos. His website is is on the page here, and rewind and replay and pick up all of those little nuances that you didn't pick up the first time. Carlos, thank you so much again. It's uh, it's always a pleasure talking to people that really know what they're doing. And and don't go anywhere, any, everybody. We have Winnie and Kyoko coming up in the chat box. Thank you for having me. Learn how to talk to your animals. You ask them a question and you receive an answer to understand their why why their anxiety, why the strange behavior, why the performance problems. When you understand your animals, you can give them what they need. Sign up now for the show special. Receive 10% off the online beginner level animal communication course. The animals chat box is the segment where I get to have a chat with some of our viewers animals. Now it's not a verbal conversation like I'd ordinarily have with someone. It's a conversation using the language of animals where we transfer images, words and feelings from one to the other. I can smell on behalf of an animal, I can taste what they taste, hear what they hear, I can feel in their body what they feel. And you can gather a lot of information communicating this way from behavioral issues to emotional and mental health issues. I can taste their food and I can feel in their body where they're unwell or where they're injured. This is often referred to as animal communication. Right now, we have some animals waiting for us in the chat box. Let's go see who they are and what they've got to say to us today. Kyoko and their dad Rich waiting for us in the chat box right now but before we jump over there I just want to share with you how they've ended up being on our show tonight. A few months ago I was looking at the technical aspects of how to run this show what lighting I needed all the equipment and that type of thing. Rich was being interviewed about this because he has his own show the Rich Wilmore show as a little aside. It's a great show I'm going to put his details at the end because it's really fun and he has some really great guests in there. He was doing an interview about all of the things that I needed to know and Kyoko, who you'll meet in a minute, jumps up on his desk and walks across in front of him. Dad puts Kyoko on the ground, Kyoko gets back up, walks back across and it was just a bit of a comedy of cats. You know, any cat owner out there knows how this goes. And so I emailed Rich afterwards and I said, Rich, this is who I am, this is what I do, I want to be on your show and talk to your cats. You don't ask, you don't know, do you? Anyway. Um, Rich got back to me, I was on his show and I was the last show for his season just recently so I thought it would be really appropriate if he was my first show of my first season. So that's why they're here with us tonight. Let's go have a chat with them and see what they've got to say for themselves. Welcome everyone, I have Winnie and Kyoko and their dad Rich in the chat box tonight. Welcome furry ones and not so furry one, well they kind of furry, they're facial yeah. furry. Yeah. <laughs> You tend to start looking like your pets, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, they say that it happens quite a lot. Um, and Kyoko, who everyone can see in the background there, Winnie's obviously not really interested tonight, but Kyoko is on a mission. She's like, come on, where she's are always, you? Yes, yeah, she's always, let me see if she'll come up here. Come here. She's usually right next to me at all times. Hello, Kyoko. It's bedtime, you see. 
but it's time to be it's time to be winding up or being fed have you fed them they have been fed yes they are they they have they're fed and she's always i was gone for a while recently for like two weeks so i had someone watching them but i just got back so she is on extra cling mode right now yes they were a little ticked off about that i have to say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. they don't like to be left alone no they need human interaction and they need dad there at all times at their beck and call mm -hmm. for any problems or things that they want to discuss so <laughs> and they were not happy i just see them prancing around not prancing almost because they were they were a bit grumpy just stomp stomping around the house going, where is he <laughs> they usually they usually when i am gone will be at the door when i come home and this time they both were hiding and not like they were so mad at me i think that they just they were hiding and they didn't come out for a couple hours because they were like you know what you need to sit and think about what you've done to us like, that's what they were thinking <laughs> Straight to the naughty corner, Dad. Yes. That's it. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly what was going on. And um, they were they were doing to you what you did to them. They were really unhappy with actually not being taken with you. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's not practical to go into state with your animals, <laughs> especially cats, because they, they're a bit of a challenge sometimes. But uh, they were just really, really quite grumpy about that whole process and because they knew you were going and the whole, I don't know whether they changed a little bit leading up to it, you know, a, a day or two or a couple of hours beforehand, but I just see them getting more and more cross the closer it got to you leaving. Mm -hmm. Yes, they all, I feel like they always know when I'm getting ready, when, when things start, you know, the travel accessories come out, I feel like <laughs> the entire mood in this in this house changes. Yeah, everything just gets a little bit frosty. Yes, yes. <laughs> Tell everyone a little bit about your cats, where you got them from, and how, how old they are, Rich. Um, Winnie, the oldest one who might make an appearance, she does every once in a while when she decides to wake up. She's about 18. I've had her, I think, since she was about three. I'm, I'm guessing she's 18, kind of judging by when I got her. She had an owner before that. Um, and she was kind of tossed around from home to home. And then I got her and I was like, you know what? She's going to stay here. She's getting older. She needs consistency. Um, and she has been, she's the perfect cat. And then someone decided that Winnie needed a friend. So uh, for my birthday one year, I was able to go to the Humane Society and pick out a cat. And that was Kyoko. And... When I brought Kyoko home, I had the cat book, like the cat kittens for dummies. I think they also bought me. <laughs> and it said in there, when you have an older cat and a younger cat to separate them um, and put the, the new one in the bathroom with the litter box and everything and kind of let them scent each other out. And so I went to bed. I did that with Kyoko. I went to bed and she screamed the entire <laughs> night. And after hours of her screaming, I was like, I can't do this, I need sleep. And I opened the door to the bathroom. She ran out of the bathroom, jumped in the bed, crawled under the comforter and just fell asleep. And she, I blame myself for how she has turned out, but that's kind of <laughs> been her personality ever since. Oh, you had me at hello. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, you don't need to lock me up, come no. on. No, she has uh, been by my side ever since. Yes, and they're quite different, aren't they? Because they both love you to bits. You know, Winnie is just like, again, I think I, I saw this last time, she just wants to get under your skin and be up here uh -huh. around your neck and your face. And Kyoko, she just loves you to bits too, but in a, in a different way. She's just like doing circle work all around you. And as she is now, the tail's kind of wrapping around and possessing you. You are mine. Can I move my camera and show you what she, where she is? Oh, no. Yeah. So she she's she's a circler, like you said. She can't sit still. She's sitting still. Let me see if I can do this now. She's sitting still now, and that's where she is. Yes. But she'll only stay there for a couple minutes, and then she'll decide to move around again. She doesn't like to be held. She doesn't really even like you to pet her, but she loves to be on you or near you. Well, yeah. maybe not really anybody else. Yes. Well, you know, she's um, what I'm seeing here with with her is that this is not about not wanting to be touched or knee, you know, on you or patted or anything like that. It's actually she's 
very sensitive. Mm. So if you imagine, you know, are you that era where we had blackboards and chalk mm -hmm. and the old fingernails on the blackboard thing and it makes your ears go, oh, my God, yeah. murder me now? Um, when you pat her, that's that same kind of feeling for her. It's like, oh, that just doesn't feel good. Mm. So it's not so much that she doesn't want it. And when she's sitting on you like she is now, it's funny because we had a few, we had a lot of technical problems before we started, everybody. We had some sound issues. And so for half an hour, we were mucking around trying to fix that. And Kyoko was doing her circle work and, it's, and she was sort of saying to me, can you just sit down? I just want to sit on you. And so there she is now. But when you're when she's sitting on you like that and you're not patting her, you're just there, then she's not feeling anything from a sensation point of view. But when you start patting her, it just like get I just feel like getting off. Yep. Get off. Don't touch me. Uh, which is nothing to do with her love for you. It's to do with how that feels on her on her body. Yeah, and when other people will go to pet her, she will back up and like and then everyone thinks she's going to like attack her or attack them and i'm like no she just she wants to be for, at a distance and know where yes you're yeah yeah and she may attack them not not for the sake of being angry and attacking them and not trusting them and that sort of thing but it's more it's like i just don't like it it doesn't feel good so don't touch me yeah. and like you say like just love me from afar yeah. <laughs> Yes. Say I hello to me and then go and sit down. <laughs> exactly. I will touch you, but you're not allowed to touch me. Yes. yes. Yeah. She's still, there's still a little bit of um, leftover crossness about this trip. Winnie, not so much. She's she's back to where she was. But Kyoko, is this a longer trip than you would ordinarily take? Or have you not been away for quite some time? Uh, this was a, a, This was almost two weeks away so that's longer than i'm normally away yes yeah yeah she's she's not happy about that she's okay with a day or two but she's not these long ones she's mm. just shaking her head saying that's just unacceptable yeah yeah you tell me and then she says you tell me to behave and you don't behave yourself <laughs> yes and she's okay. also saying that that is not just about you going away you behaving yourself C covers a few areas. <laughs> oh boy, we're gonna have to chat. Yeah, <laughs> we have to chat. We're not gonna chat about that on air. <laughs> um, <laughs> the nighttime version. Yeah, yeah. Is it the the uh, the midnight hour. Uh huh. She's she's happy with food. So you've changed the food up. Last time we spoke, there was a few things with vomiting and and food. Who was that related to? Was that both of them? I can't remember. Just remind me what was going on there. It was it was mostly Winnie, but they were both throwing up. Yes. Yeah, and you've changed food for both of them. I did. Mm. I feel much more nourished and 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 full. Actually, have you noticed a change in behaviour with either of them? Um, I feel like they're eating like less of it. Uh, Winnie has been awake more. She was sleeping a lot and she's now kind of moving around and awake more. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I mean, unless it's two and three and four o'clock in the morning, which they kind of like to do, that that feels like a good response, actually. Again, it's that nutrition thing. That they, they seem to be getting um, good nutrition, so eating less, having more energy. Now, do you play with them? Um, sometimes they only like one toy and playing with them is usually me throwing at them running to it and then me walking to it and throwing it somewhere else. Winnie's just talking about play. Let me just see what she's, what she's on about here. She's saying that's a very one dimensional game and it doesn't last very long and she gets bored with it. Sometimes we need to teach them too how to play because it's really important. It's important for their, you know, regardless of how old they are, it's just you tone down like a human, you do less of as you get older. But um, we still need to be mentally stimulated and our body needs to move and it helps with our digestion and all that sort of thing as well. So um, for both of them, see if you can investigate some new toys. Okay. And Kyoko might be a little bit harder because she's just in terms of training to play because she's a little bit dismissive. She's sort of sitting in the background. 
not e terribly excited about this conversation. She just wants to talk about her. So I don't, I don't want to talk about toys. I don't want to talk about Winnie. Let's come back to me because I'm very important. Right. Um, but I feel like we need to cover off the, the play factor. So you might need to do a little bit of work with Kyoko just to get her trained into the play idea. And Winnie still needs to do some things to be mentally stimulated. Move their food into different locations so they sort of feel like they're hunting for it okay. or they're looking for their food. Because what we do as we domesticate our cats is we get our little china plate out or their special bowl and we put the, put the food in it and we put it in the same place all of the time. And cats love to hunt, they love to chase and, you know, that kind of thing. So it's important for us to reteach them how to hunt in a way. I saw recently someone talking about that, like they got a spoon and put a little bit of food on it and they made their cat chase them down the passage. Oh. And, then they, and then they brought the food back. They didn't let them eat it. They brought the food back and then they put it away and then... An hour later, they did the same thing. And after a few goes of that, the cat was then starting to kind of tap his hand down and, and fight for that food. And that was, it's teaching them how to hunt for their food. And then he has about seven different locations throughout his house where he feeds his cats and they've got to find it. So I'm just feeling like that with yours. Um, have a look at what toys are out there. Play around with where you put the food and sort of reteach them how to be a cat, how to bring right. out that innate nature of, of hunting and winning. Okay. Can I ask a question about the food, like changing the food up? Yeah, please do. So Winnie has, Winnie has cataracts and doesn't see very well. Is that still something to do with her or is that going to trip her up? Show her where you're taking it. Okay. So, you know, you would put it, sort of put it under her nose and and take it. You might you might not take hers very far. Like just, you know, mix it up. It might be a different corner of the kitchen or it might be a little bit around the corner or something like that. So, because um, her smell is okay. Uh -huh. Her smell is still pin sharp. So just um, guide her with it. Put it sort of under her nose and let her follow you. And you might do that a couple of times if you've got the time. And then you know, the second time, third time, just put it down so she's with you, she knows. And then you might mix it up and put it somewhere else okay. the next day. So she will get to know, um, you know, and if you if you leave food out for her when you go out of the house or to work or whatever, that she might start to try and find it, go to these new little nooks and crannies. So, yeah, her, her cataracts, um, you know, it doesn't really matter that she can't see so well because she can certainly smell. Oh, okay. She wants you to uh, not worry about her so much that she is just progressing as she should be. Okay. And so if you are the type of person, because cat people can be a little bit like this, they're hard to read. So anything that just is slightly off or odd, we go into panic mode and we, what's going on? Are they dying? We go straight to are they dying or have they got cancer or is it the kidney disease or whatever it is that, that cats often get. She's wanting you just to um, try not to go into panic mode if she looks a little bit off okay. and to accept where she's at with her age. I feel like she's been around for so long that I... I uh... Yeah, I don't remember really a time without her, really. As yeah. A, as I have had her since I was in college, you know. So mm. it's interesting yeah. to watch her slow down. And and you're you're totally right. And this is, she slowed down a lot after she got really sick a couple of years ago. Um, and and so I've been like, I'm, I'm like a hovering parent where I'm like, are you okay? Like I'm constantly like putting the mirror up to her nose to see if she's breathing. <laughs> And because I know she sleeps a lot, so I don't know what she's doing over there. <laughs> no? Oh, that's great. I love it. I mean, that's a caring parent for you, isn't it? So that's what we want. We want caring parents. Um, but she just wants you to be a little bit less paranoid. <laughs> you know. And that, you know, she is going to pass. So you, you can't put off the inevitable. Right. Um, and just... 
I want to say this is this is some words that may sound a little bit strange, but I, I just feel like I need to say embrace it, like embrace the, the ageing process and, you know, the last sort of stages of, of her life. I feel uncomfortable talking about um, a cat passing, um, but it is a, it's a part of life and it's unfortunate but true. Um, well, my biggest thing is I don't want her to suffer. So you yeah, know, I, I don't want to keep her alive selfishly because I don't want to let her go. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I am always, I am totally hovering all the time because I want to, I want to make sure that she is comfortable. And if she's not, then I have to deal with that. And I'm, and I'm, I'm prepared to, I think as much as I can be. And so it's, it's a real thing that I think a lot of people I've seen it. I've seen family members keep pets alive way too long and they're suffering. And I think that's an awful thing to do to an animal that can't tell you what's wrong and you know, something's wrong and you're not dealing with it. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, um, that's a really important, important point too that um and this is where animal communication is a great thing because when our animals do get to that stage because i've come across a lot that actually want to pass themselves i don't want intervention i just want to go and find their favorite tree or you know their spot and let nature take its course mm -hmm. and then there's the others that want some help and and the help is not to, you know, more cancer treatment or more medication or more surgery. The help is to, okay, you know, you need to let me go because I'm staying here because you, you're not ready yet. And they, and they do, they stay around for us when we're not, when the human part of us is not ready to let them go. And then once that, once that happens, once there's an acknowledgement and an acceptance from mum and dad, um, then they will pass or you'll know that they need to to go somewhere so it's uh, it's a really worthy conversation and I have someone coming up down the track that is here to talk to us about uh, grief counseling for pet parents mm. and I think that's such a such an important area as well because it's quite traumatic and you know you've had her for 15 years yeah. uh, you know that's a long time they get under your skin and we love them like our own family. So it's um, it's a very important thing to consider, but she's not going anywhere I'm just sure. at this point. She's making her way in here now. Oh, she knows. Aren't you beautiful? She looks like she's got a bit of Maine Coon or something in her. Hey, that's what everybody says. She must. Winnie's having trouble grooming herself, so she gets mats. I try to brush her as much as possible, but she, you know, it bothers her, so we have to stop after a little bit. Yeah, that's a really interesting conversation too. I just want to see what she has to say about that not grooming herself as well as she used to be able to. She doesn't necessarily like the brushing, but it's like a, a necessary evil. She knows she needs it, and I would say daily okay. to some degree. Like, you know, it might just be a minute or two, but just every day just um, and and including her tail. So if you haven't been including her tail in that brushing, under the chest, under the chin, all, all over. Okay. Both of, them, both of them are very happy with their life, their lives, their location and you, especially when you stay home, they're aware that you're not there as much as you used to be and they're okay with that provided you come home. It's when, you, when, it's when you don't go, come home for two weeks that there's an issue. Thank you, Winnie and Kyoko. Thanks for making an appearance too. That's great to see you live, up sure. close and personal. And thanks, Rich, for bringing them in. Oh, yeah. Don't go anywhere, everybody. We are going to be right back in just a moment. Make your day richer with The Richard Wilmore Show. Meet amazing musicians, talented actors, brilliant authors, hilarious comedians, and the most creative people in entertainment. Download the KP Media TV app to watch on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire. That's the show for tonight, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel so you know what's coming up. And then follow the pages, Facebook, Instagram, and the website. Once you've done that, share the love around. Thanks for joining me. I'm Romy Bueller. I will see you back here next week.